So there's a whole bunch of ways to do a signal buffer. My personal favorite is the voltage follower, which is just an op amp in Unity gain configuration. And then you can throw a push-pull amplifier on the output. But this is about the emitter follower, which is similar but not the same. In my operational transconductance amplifier intro video, I made the mistake of calling the emitter follower a voltage follower. Today I'm going to explain what the emitter follower is, which is what that buffer actually was, in that video. The downside of the emitter follower amplifier is it's a little bit more complex, it's a little bit more work than just throwing an op amp in there. But the upside is it uses only basic components. And I consider an op amp to be a basic component, but it is still technically a chip. This only uses transistors, resistors, and optionally a capacitor. So let's get to it. So the purpose of a voltage buffer is to present a very high impedance, stable impedance input to connect to a low impedance output that can be loaded. You have a signal, you have a load. You just wire them together and that can cause some problems. First of all, you may be drawing too much power from the signal generator and you could burn it out. Additionally, the operation of this load could affect the operation of the signal generator. There could be parallel resistances and whatnot going on in there. So you could actually distort your signal just by having the load there. So you just stick a buffer in the middle and you're good. The emitter follower uses one transistor. The Darlington emitter follower uses two. You could technically use as many as you want to, as long as you have a huge voltage, but you're not going to use more than two. You can also do it single supply, as in you only have positive voltage, or dual supply where you have positive and negative voltage. Whenever you're doing analog signal processing and amplifying, you want positive and negative voltages. You don't have to have that. I'll go over both configurations. It's just so much easier. So let's say we'll start with the positive and negative dual-sided power supply. So there's your positive supply rail, negative supply rail, and circuit ground. So we have our signal, reference to circuit ground, of course, and we're going to assume there is no DC bias on this signal. If there is, you can just slap a capacitor on there in series to remove the DC bias. But we're assuming there's none, there shouldn't be. So we just need one transistor, one NPN BJT. So this is the regular emitter follower, so it only has one transistor. Darlington has two, this has one. The collector is connected to the positive rail. We have an emitter resistor, and this is connected to the negative rail. In the OTA video, I had a ground symbol here. That was just a mistake. It's supposed to be a negative symbol. This is the window, the amplification window. So the signal can go up and down between the positive and negative rails, and it always is high enough that it never hits the low rail, and it's always low enough that it never hits the high rail. Our signal connects to the base, and then we have our load. The load reference to circuit ground, of course, and we take our output here. So we usually think of the BJT as a current controlled device, but in reality, remember, everything is actually voltage controlled. Voltage creates current, end of story, when you're dealing with wires. So if you look, we have two Kirchhoff loops here. The first one is positive supply through collector to emitter junction through this resistor and out to negative, and then of course back to positive. So there's only two voltage drops here, the collector to emitter and this resistor. Now we have another loop from circuit ground through the signal, through the base to emitter junction, through this resistor, negative out to circuit ground. This is called an emitter follower, but it's very similar to a voltage follower. It kind of does the same thing, which is why I confused it. The emitter resistor voltage follows the signal voltage. So this voltage here is going to be the signal voltage minus the base to emitter junction. If this signal is zero, this is going to be minus 0.7-ish. If this is 3 volts, this is going to be 2.3 or whatever. And it's going to go up and down linearly and match the voltage as long as you don't slam up or down against the positive or negative supply rails. The signal is always going to be close to zero or around the area of zero because it's referenced to circuit ground, but you've got negative here, so base to emitter is always forward biased. Class A amplifier uses more power, better signal fidelity. So through quantum mechanical magic, the transistor self-regulates. The voltage drop over the collector to emitter is going to be the leftover after this. So the whole positive to negative supply minus the voltage drop on the resistor equals the voltage drop on collector to emitter. To get that to happen, here's where our idea of it being current controlled comes in. It's going to self-regulate the base current as well. 
So it's only going to draw as much base current as required to get itself to conduct the proper amount to drive the load and to have this emitter resistor have the correct voltage drop across it. I know it sounds weird because that's not how we usually use BJTs, but trust me. I've done it in my oscilloscope and breadboard. It does work. The transistor manages its own base current to make it work. So this fits the role of a high impedance input. The base to emitter voltage drop is generally going to be constant. The current draw of the base is going to vary only a very tiny amount because Again, we think of it as a current amplifier, so the base current gets amplified to the collector current, and it goes through here. The signal is only supplying the base current, because it's self-regulating to let that go through. The collector is supplying the load. The transistor is only letting through the base current it needs to get the correct conduction through this transistor. And then the collector is supplying everything else through this load. Now there is one issue, how I mentioned the signal. So if you've got your signal, we go through this base to emitter junction and it drops the voltage. The signal is the same, but the voltage is reduced. You're essentially biasing the signal down. So what you do is of course, what we always do, we slap a series capacitor on there. So we have our output, goes through a capacitor, through the load. This removes the DC bias, and there you go. So you have a high impedance stable connection to your signal generator, and you have a power amplifier into your load. Although it's not a great power amplifier, it's not a huge one, but it's a little bit. It's definitely good because it's taking the full burden of the load off of the signal generator. But maybe you need a little more. In comes Darlington. We need a another transistor. Now it's the Darlington emitter follower. So we have another NPN, again connected to a positive supply. Of course we move over the output there. The emitter connects to the base, and then we have our load, and again our capacitor to remove the bias. So it's just the same as before. Now we've got circuit ground through the signal, through base to emitter, through base to emitter, through resistor to negative, and through to circuit ground. Same kind of loop. We have positive through collector to emitter, through resistor to negative, and back to positive. Same kind of loop. Except here, we have an amplifier for the amplifier. So you'll notice it goes through base to emitter twice. So you say, that's two diode drops. Yeah, so you have your original signal, your first diode drop, your second diode drop. But again, if your negative voltage is low enough, all you're doing is biasing the signal down, slap your capacitor on there to unbias it, and you're done. So what happens here? Exactly the same thing. If we ignore this for a moment, if we just take this away and connect it directly, we just have the regular emitter follower. So there is a voltage drop being set here, which is the signal minus two base to emitters, and then the collector to emitter junction self-regulates, which means its base current self-regulates, so it only draws the base current that it needs to get this resistor to give the correct voltage drop, but that base current, which was being supplied by the signal generator, is now being supplied by the collector. The same way this collector is feeding this load, this collector is feeding the base here, and there's a current amplification just like usual. This collector to emitter is self-regulating because this base is taking only so much current and it has a voltage drop and this voltage drop. So this, this together, this base to emitter to resistor is basically the emitter resistor here. If we imagine a resistor here, this emitter resistor on here is the effective resistance of the base to emitter junction and then this resistor. So it's trying to self-regulate its voltage drop across the pretend resistor here is whatever's left over goes to here. Just like this collector to emitter junction is what's left over after this. This collector to emitter junction is what's left over after this. The base through the resistor instead of just the resistor. So this one is self-regulating and only drawing so much base current. And it's amplifying the current conceptually. So now we have even less current coming in from the signal generator. A mere trickle is coming into this base, which is being amplified from a collector feed directly from the positive supply rail, which is feeding this base, which is drawing only what it needs. And it's being amplified to drive the load through its collector. So now we have a much stronger one. Now I'm not talking about amps here. The one on the 13700, the LM13700 OTA, the data sheet says it's only rated for 20 milliamps because it's in the chip, it's tiny little resistors, so it can only dissipate so much power. If you're using discrete components, like in a breadboard, you can probably have an amp, or at least half an amp going through this, I bet, depending on your transistor. You know, throw a little middle clip on there as a heatsink, you'll probably be fine. And of course, you can just buy a transistor 
that's designed for a lot of power to go through it, and that'll be fine. But the point is, this is an incredibly high input impedance and incredibly stable because the current through this base is already a very small swing because it's being amplified through the collector. And then it's only needing a small swing here to get this small swing because this is amplified by the collector. So it's a fraction of a fraction of a swing. So your impedance, your input impedance is much higher and much smaller swing, so more stable. So that's why Darlington. If you add a third transistor, it'll get even better. But at that point, the currents are too small. You might actually no longer have enough current to drive the thing. This might try to go too small. It won't even turn on. BJTs do have a minimum base current to operate. So if there's too much effective resistance, then it's just not going to work. And you could solve that by adding more voltage. Or you can just use two like everybody does. But that's how this works. Now, what about the single-ended version? It's exactly the same. If you recall the common emitter amplifier, we just bias the input. So we have our signal. And of course, now we only have this. We don't have a negative supply. So this is going to be referenced to ground. So we're going to need to bias the signal. So we have our bias capacitor, and then we need our voltage divider, just like usual. So here's our voltage divider. We connect our capacitor through it, and then our biased voltage goes into the base. So this has the effect of removing the DC bias. It protects the signal from being biased backwards, but it also removes the bias because this is circuit ground, there's no negative voltage. So your signal is going to be between zero and your positive rail. So this will bias it to zero volts. Then it'll bias it up so that it's within the operating range of the transistor so that base to emitter to base to emitter and out to ground is going to be at least two diode drops to make sure both base to emitter junctions are always on. You're not turning the transistors off. You're not hitting the positive supply. So if your signal is going all the way to positive and negative or positive and zero rail, you know, if you're using your full voltage as the signal, you're going to have a problem. So this needs to be a smaller one. So you bias it up so that it works right. It works exactly the same. And then here's your capacitor that removes this bias again, which you might not want to have because again, this is referenced to zero. So if your load is another filter stage or whatever, if your load is operating on only single supply, then you have your bias not only make sure it's in the operating range, but also stays in the operating range for the load. So you have to make sure your signal's not too big. You have to decide whether you need the capacitor here. You have to manage your bias. It's a whole pain in the butt. So I always recommend using positive and negative voltage when you can when working with analog signals and especially when amplifying. But there you go. All you do is your capacitor and your voltage divider, and then probably no capacitor here. If you need, you could have another capacitor and voltage divider bias if you need a different bias there, but this is probably what you're going to use. And there you go. It all works out because the transistors self-regulate. So I always like the voltage follower better, just an op-amp with a push-pull output, but this will definitely get you where you're going. And I'm not going to bother showing you on the oscilloscope because all it is is just your signal, and then I run it through the first transistor and it's going down and the second transistor goes down and then I put the capacitor and it goes back to normal. We're not amplifying the signal, we're not changing the signal, we're just letting it draw less power from the signal generator and more from the power directly, more from the supply directly. All we're doing is shifting the burden to the battery or the wall plug from the signal circuit. So as usual, if I have explained this poorly, please let me know. I can always answer questions or redo the video for the moment. I'll be seeing you.